Joe Boxman with the plant based plate. Okay, so here's a study on bitter melon, which is something that I've I've incorporated myself. Uh, I've gone to the um, international market and I've got the frozen version, but it's always kind of hard to stomach. And we are here with. Uh, hi, I'm Tony. Uh, I'm the author of this study. In this study, we recruited eight participants with type 2 diabetes. Uh -huh. And what we did is a like two by two crossover design. Mm -hmm. So each individual goes through two conditions in a randomized uh, order. Mm -hmm. First is the exercise condition. In that condition, they walk for 30 minutes uh -huh. after a meal. In the second condition, they consume 100 million layers of bitter melon juice. Right, which is 3.3 .3 ounces as we uh, previously right. yeah, figured out, which is like a shot yes. of bitter so, melon juice. Two conditions. Um, and then we compare the post prandial glucose response after um, uh, oral glucose solution uh -huh. consumption. So our results show that there's no significant differences in each time point through the base from baseline through the two hours window. There's no difference between these two conditions, uh -huh. which suggests that Vietnam is an alternative method to lower post prandial glucose for people who uh, cannot or doesn't have time to exercise. Wow. So the bitter melon group did not do the walking? Yes, they just keep sitting for two hours. And, and, the, and, and both groups had a meal before? Uh, we used the 75 gram uh, glucose solution. Both groups had that? Yes, both groups have that. And, and so the, the one group did the walking, the other one just had the, the bitter melon juice? Right. Exactly. That is phenomenal. Um, and, and you were saying, so did you? How did you? Um, how did you extract the juice? Did you use a juicer to? Yes, yeah, so we used the juicer. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Great job. Thank you. All right, you guys. So I'm here and I'm getting ready to attend this super awesome seminar on autophagy and muscle mass. So that's the, that's the title of the study, or the seminar, I'm sorry. Amazing. So looking forward to watching this here. And this place will fill up, I'm about, about 20 minutes early, but it will be a packed house in this uh, auditorium, but certainly, um, a lot of knowledge that I picked up in this conference and you know things change and know how, you know how I 2016 and so forth I was into autophagy and fasting I still am but autophagy if it's done too often can increase muscle loss atrophy so how do we benefit how do we get the best of autophagy while minimizing the caveat of it right and that's my concurrent train and nutritarian plant-based approach that's a mouthful, but if you break it down, it makes scientific sense. So, stay tuned. And also, I was telling one of the um, presenters, I was telling him how autophagy, when someone does a fast, like prolonged fast, like 13 hours or more, and which is not really that long, but 16 hours is a standard, right? 16, eight. So if you do a 16 hour fast, it's like steady state cardio, just straight through, right? 30 minutes straight. I do interval fasting. So what I'll do is I'll do maybe a 12-hour fast, which is standard, like dinner's at 7, breakfast is at 7 a.m. That's a 12-hour fast. Then I'll have a 6 to 8-hour intermeal fast from breakfast to lunch. So I'll have a later lunch, and I still have dinner. So I have that three meals. But, I, but if you look at the accumulated fasting window, it's 12 plus whatever between breakfast and lunch was, which let's say it's 6 to 8, right? That's, 18, that's an 18 to 20 hour fast. 
that's a long period of time not eating while maintaining muscle. And that's the key, is to stimulate autophagy, but to uh, maintain muscle. And autophagy does that, but too much of autophagy can reduce muscle. And studies, I've, I've seen studies at this conference that have shown that. So that's why I have the video on how to stimulate autophagy feasting, how to increase autophagy feasting. Most people talk about fasting. I'm not saying those people are wrong, but there's also a truth to eating the right foods can actually stimulate autophagy. So, and exercise stimulates autophagy as well, right there. So as you guys can see here, this is one pound of fat and one pound of muscle. They weigh the same, but as you can see, the volume is a lot greater here. So oftentimes you'll see a guy, or me for example, and I don't look big, right? But that doesn't mean I don't have an adequate amount of muscle. And my fat-free mass index shows that because my body mass index is in the higher end. And uh, I have a, a healthy body fat percentage, which is on the lower end. And once again here, you can see this is even more pronounced of a difference. Look at this. Five pounds of muscle weighs a lot, but it doesn't take up a lot of space. Five pounds of fat weighs the same as this. Look how much space it takes up. It's a density difference, guys, a density difference. So don't just look at, that's why you never should, uh, you never should just look at the appearance of a person in clothes. You need to actually take their body composition to be able to specifically know whether they have enough muscle or not. Because if you're lean, chances are it can be deceptive and you don't look like you have a lot, but you do. And oftentimes that'll be a surprise when someone, when you see someone, when they take their shirt off and you do a, a, some sort of body comp test, then you see another person, huge in the shirt, right? The shirt can't even fit them. Take the shirt off, you see smooth, no kind of, you know, indentations or definition. Now, it doesn't mean they don't have a lot of muscle, but it also means they have a lot of this too. Not just muscle, but they have a lot of that. I'm interested in having a lot of this and less of that.